one main source recently that's been giving us a lot of great information of things that have happened specifically within Warren's family as one of Warren's children. There are some things within the revelation that are extremely dangerous, particularly to the women and children that are still in. Once he once he gets back out, once he's released from prison, heavenly sessions are to start again. Wow. And he's, he's giving revelations that that's going to be something that is going to be started again. Along with the scariness of these revelations is that there's children who are still in it without their mothers. We were recently talking to a close friend who's she's been out for about a year. I think she has three daughters who are back in it and chose to go back to the FLDS. Mm. And oh, I'm going to try not to get emotional, but she's like, I hope the next time that I see my daughters, I'm not identifying their bodies. Oh. It's frightening. And I have loved ones. I have family members that still follow and believe in him full heartedly. And to think that they could just be gone because he says to do something is just terrifying. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola. And I'm Jonathan Rosales. And this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're only listening and you want to see all four of our faces today, you can go to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can like, subscribe, become an advocate for these people bravely coming on and sharing their stories. Leave those words of encouragement or comments. We love to see what you guys have to say. Helps the algorithm and it helps our guests feel so supported. So today's guests, plural, we've had them on before. They are a little bit of experts in their fields because they grew up, well, one of them grew up in the FLDS, which is the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as Mormon. Sometimes we refer to them as uh, the mainstream Mormon church as LDS. They're from the FLDS. And um, the other one grew up mainstream Mormon, just like myself. So another husband-wife team, I'll just bring them on and then we'll talk about what we're going to talk about. So thanks for joining us, Sam and Melissa. Thanks, hey. Elise and thanks Jonathan. We're happy to be here. Of course. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I'm joined by Jonathan as well, my yes. husband and co-producer. Thanks for coming on, babe. Thank you. Yes. This whole FLDS set, you've been watching all these documentaries in the background and I, I've just, I've got questions for <laughs> Sam and Melissa. So I'm here for that. <laughs> We're yes. happy to answer questions. We love them. We like questions. Go ahead. Yeah. We've been going deep into, well, we started off with mainstream Mormonism because of everything that's been going on in the news, transitioned into some FLDS, some Lebanon group um, back to FLDS and this is a really really great follow-up so I'm glad that you guys reached out with this because everyone wants to know what's going on with Warren Jeffs who was the prophet of the FLDS switched things around for a little bit of context he took over the FLDS as the prophet and really just kind of flipped things on its head things were extremely strict um, he was sending people away splitting up families and ultimately ended up in prison because of CSA with multiple young girls in this compound in Texas. So he is still alive in prison and he is still giving orders to people outside, the people who are true believing members of the FLDS as well. And I want to get your opinion on Sam and Melissa on what you know as far as how many people are still kind of following him. Do we know anything like that? Yes. So, yeah, we do. We have a, a good source that we need to keep anonymous, but is one of Warren Jeff's children, a uh, direct child. And they said that there are about 4,000 followers and 2,000 that are very loyal, devoted. Mm. Ish. You know, we're, we're, I mean, this is estimate, a, a, yeah. yeah, an estimate at this point because there's, there's different levels of commitment, I guess. I mean, I look at my own family. There are some of them that are still quote unquote followers of Warren Jeff's but they're not necessarily going with every single thing that is coming from prison or things that are coming from other people that he is having send information out. But they, they just say that they believe in him. And then mm -hmm. there's those about 2,000 people that will do anything he says. Anything that comes from Warren Jeffs or his, I guess, spokesperson, whoever that may be, we'll get into that, is 100%. They're, they're all on board and they will do whatever they say. Mm -hmm. And this is because I want to give further context for those who aren't familiar with Mormonism. The big part about Mormonism and especially the fundamentalist Mormon sects and different groups, because there are many, not just the FLDS, is they believe in one true prophet on the earth. So this man was appointed by God. He is receiving direct revelation from God, according to them. And so they really think, well, they're following this man, they're following God. And some of you may think, well, 
isn't it obvious he's in prison for doing these horrible things? Why would anyone still follow him? We have to remember that with the original prophet, Joseph Smith, he was also put in jail and martyred. And so it kind of, especially within the mainstream Mormon church, and I'm sure you remember this as well, Melissa, is they kind of use that as a faith promoting story instead of what should be the opposite. Instead of going, wait a second, why was he in jail? It was, see, he's in jail because he's so persecuted and it's the adversary trying to bring him down. Do you remember stories like that? Absolutely. And you gave the perfect example. And we tell people this all the time, you know, especially when LDS people ask and they're like, well, if the prophet's in prison, why isn't that enough of a sign? And I use Joseph Smith as an example. And the FLDS use Joseph Smith as an example right. all the time. They say, listen, he was imprisoned, falsely imprisoned, same as Joseph Smith. Um, the world is painting this picture of him that isn't true. They're mm. all liars. They're trying to convince us of something that's not true, you know, and if he dies in there, he'll be a martyr and it will be another faith promotion for the FLDS people if he does die in prison. Now, right now they're saying that he is going, that the, the walls will be coming down and that he will be released from prison is what they've been saying. But in the case that that doesn't happen, which we know it's not going to, then it will be just one more sign that he is the true prophet of God because the devil fights harder Satan is going to fight harder against true righteousness. You yeah. know, if he was a false prophet, then why would Satan be trying so hard to persecute him? Yeah, there's there's a word that they like to use. And I remember this as a young boy growing up out there and it's fabricate. And we use that a lot. Whenever we would hear from an outside source, we weren't allowed to have TV. So we didn't get to watch TV and see what was going on in the news. But when we heard from an outside source, hey, we heard that one of your leaders did this, that, and the other. And we would immediately go to, oh, no, it's just been fabricated. Satan and his followers are fabricating this information to make these people look bad. Mm. So just to point out that what Warren Jeffs is in prison for, a lot of his followers don't believe that ever happened. Mm -hmm. Wasn't there a moment when Jeff was in prison where he had a kind of a moment of weakness where he was like, you know what? I'm not the prophet. Actually, yeah. forget all of that. You have it on camera. And then the people kind of came and said, no, you are. And then he kind of redacted and was like, no, no, you're right. You're right. I'm, I've always been the prophet. Yes, yes. It was his brother. So he had convinced his followers to the point that when he wanted to give up, when he finally wanted to just come out and tell the truth and say, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. Don't follow me. Don't listen to me. His followers were so convinced that of what he had said that they wouldn't let him get away with it that easily. They said, no, you are the prophet and we love you and you need to continue doing this and you need to continue having the strength to do what God wants you to do. That was the, the mindset behind it. And I would dare say that that's another comparison to Joseph Smith, because there was a time that Joseph Smith um, had a revelation that they were supposed to, he sent missionaries to go and, and sell the um, trademark to the Book of Mormon mm -hmm. or, and, you know, and he was sent to a, they sent his missionaries to a specific city and this is where it's supposed to be. And when that didn't work out and they came back, he said, well, this just proves that some revelations are from God and some are from Satan. So even the prophet himself supposedly can be influenced by Satan at times. And so if that's the case, then, you know, he was influenced by Satan to give these prophets or to say uh, that he was no longer a prophet, but that's just a momentary lapse of him. Scary, right? It's mm -hmm. so scary because if you indoctrinate someone to that level, you can say and do anything and they will still believe you because they have reasons and excuses for all of the above. It's just really terrifying. I remember seeing the footage of him it saying that through the phone call through the wall on the um, the documentary that Brielle was on Prisoner of the Prophet on HBO, mm -hmm. I believe. So yep. guys, also, if whoever's listening, if you would like to get more information on this, there are great documentaries, Keep Sweet, Pray and Obey. And then we have Prisoner of the Prophet on HBO. So you can go see in depth what we're talking about, the level, the extent of abuse, this was stuff that he recorded. This isn't even just allegations. They have recorded proof of what they would call, what he would call, quote, heavenly sessions with underage girls in this temple setting as a whole guise of it being a spiritual thing. And it makes me want to throw up just talking about it. So it's incredibly dangerous. And that's why we wanted to do this update episode, because there's so much information that is still leaving the prison. And I don't know why they haven't just cut him off and not let him speak to anybody, because <laughs> it's truly frightening what he's still continuing to say. 
Yeah. Yeah. They, so for a while they stopped communication. So when he first was put into prison, he was giving phone calls to his followers and he would, you know, people would have to listen on the line or they would do that over the pulpit or to people's homes, um, particularly within his family. And he would talk for hours and hours and hours on end and give, you know, these revelations, what was supposed to happen. And then according to our sources, then that kind of stopped over COVID for a little bit and it all became handwritten. A lot of times he has scribes going in and they're writing down everything that he says. So it's, you know, face to face. And then now he's able to do phone calls again since COVID happened. So maybe I have that mixed up. Yeah, like, that's the other way around. Oh, so sorry about during, that. During COVID, the phone calls were allowed and then and then they yeah they in. had stopped because everyone asked like why do you still let them why do you still let him make phone calls anymore and so mm -hmm. they stopped and then they started it again but most of the time it's with scribes and they're going in and having face to face contact and just writing every single thing that happened right yeah it's it's scary you brought up the heavenly sessions which I don't I don't want to focus a lot of time on because that is just like you said it makes me want to throw up thinking about all of that but I just wanted to point out that. <laughs> even though a lot of his followers do know, and they were even unfortunately a part of these things that happened, they believe, or he had convinced them that it's not what he wanted. Warren Jeffs didn't want to be in these heavenly sessions and he oh, didn't geez. want to be exploiting these women this way. It's what God was requiring of him. Just like Joseph Smith said. Yes. And he would be suffering for the sins of the world and he would be in pain during these sessions and all of this, that, and the other. It wasn't what he wanted. It's what God called him to do. That's That was the message being given to these people to convince them that all of this was okay. Mm -hmm. And apparently the heavenly sessions, um, the child of Warren Jeffs that had spoken to us anonymously had said that they had sisters who left because they were the scribe for their father while he was in prison. And he was telling them about these heavenly sessions and them having to be started again. And when these girls were writing down what was going to be happening, they actually chose to leave because they thought, I do not want to be a part of this. I can't do this. What, mm -hmm. what I'm writing down is too horrific. He was going to try and continue and perpetuate the abuse outside of Himself? Oh yes. Yeah. Once he once he gets back out, once he's released from prison, heavenly sessions are to start again. Wow. And he's, he's giving revelations that that's going to be something that is going to be started again. And luckily, it snapped out. I think he, I think they said at least two of the daughters left because of what they found out. Those actually meant. Isn't this right. information that should be handed over to authorities to make sure he never gets out of prison? Because clearly, he's not sorry for what he did. Yes. Yes. So a lot of these revelations and things that we hear and that are given to us from different sources, they are turned into the authorities. The authorities yeah. are aware of, Good. I think, everything we know at this point. Everything we, that we've found. Either, either we have or other people have made them aware of it. Yeah. So the hard thing is, is you can't really prosecute a crime that hasn't happened yet, right? Yeah. And so unfortunately, whatever he says, they can keep an eye on him, but the likelihood he's going to be released in this lifetime, he has been in solitary for them to basically finish a bunch of the lawsuits against him because as of, I think it was last year, there were still lawsuits against him. And so they're kind of keeping him there. And then from everything we hear, as soon as they release him into gen pop and they're done with the lawsuits, they'll put him into gen pop and they don't expect him to last a year hmm. because pedophiles don't last long in prison. You mean so someone from the of, inside will probably take him out. That's the idea. Or that's, sorry. I, I don't have, I have no plans here. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> that's what that, we hear. That, 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 I'm hearing that kind of thing happens. That's all I'm saying. Oh, so funny. <laughs> one of the, one of the visuals that really stuck with me in Keep Sweet, Pray, Obey was, uh, I think one of the episodes started with the little group of followers that were still outside of his prison cell. Do you know with your insider information, is that still a thing? Are people still outside daily or the wives you mean? Is that it was it the wives? Some of his wives, yeah. As far as we know, I haven't heard of anybody being outside. Most of his family is now on compounds in North Dakota, according to our source our sources. So mm -hmm. a lot of his more recent revelations, um, some that he released in August of twenty twenty two, July and August, and then as well as August of twenty twenty three. I've been talking about gathering up because the end of times is near. It's in 
in 2022 is five and a half years. So it's like about four years away. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're recreating Zion and bringing everyone together to be prepared for the lifting up of his people. So from what we understand, all of his direct family or immediate family and most of his wives are all in compounds preparing for the second coming. Yeah, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean all of them are there. We just know a lot of them are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think out of all of the wives, we were told that only about 15 have left. And he had, how many wives was it? He had 79 at one point. Jeez. And only 15 have left. Ooh. Yeah, There's still a lot of women that are or, or ex current wives, I guess, whatever, that are waiting for him and still believing in him. That's just a mm. lot of people. Brielle, who we had on just uh, the last couple episodes, she was the 65th wife. So even after mm -hmm. her, he had more wives. Wow, 79. Yeah, yeah. we yeah. love Brielle. She's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. She insider information. Yeah, this, that's, uh, that sounds exciting. How long have you guys had an insider in, <laughs> in the works? Well, I'd say there's not just even just one person, but on our YouTube channel, there are a lot of people that are leaving um, we hear come to our channel because they know that we don't just bash on the people. We're not saying that these people are horrible people. Mm -hmm. We know that the people are good people trying to do their best, trying to follow who they believe is a prophet. And it's the leaders who are corrupt and doing all these awful things. And most of the time, the people are just living the best lives they can. And right. so we try to be a soft landing for people that are leaving and people that do leave and watch us and feel that comfort tend to reach out to us. And mm. a lot of them, when they're first leaving, they're still getting sent the revelations as if they are true believers. And then they'll message them to us and send them or text them or whatever and let us know what's going on so that we can reveal it in a way that's um, right. kind, I guess. Yeah, we have a few different people, which we're very thankful for, that will share information with us. Some of them are still kind of in it. You know, they haven't fully moved away from it. And so they're they're hearing information and helping us out in that way. So it's been it's been very helpful to have these different sources. But I would say the majority of them are people that have recently left and they're willing mm -hmm. to share information. Yeah. Some of them not even willing to come out publicly and talk. So they're left anonymous. We're not really going to share their name yeah. sure. just for their safety. And uh, so anyway, but it's very helpful to get that information from someone so recently in it. Yeah. And a lot of them are still processing, right? Like it's a huge process. And so they're leaving, they're looking for people who maybe have more information, but are presenting it in a way that isn't bashing. And so um, when they have a chance to be able to kind of get things off their chest in an anonymous way, and a lot of them tend to call us and say, I want you guys to know what's going on. I want the world to know what's going on. And then when I'm ready with my story, then I'll come to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we just try to be supportive of wherever they are. Yeah, it's really great that they have you guys out there in the public eye and people know that there are places they can turn. And also you guys and holding out help are great resources yeah. for those who are looking. And I also just wanted to bring up the sources and not name names, of course, but to let people know on the outside or someone who may be watching, maybe a true believer, that these sources are reliable and we're not just making stuff up. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, they're definitely reliable. Uh, like you said, one main source recently that's been giving us a lot of great information of things that have happened specifically within Warren's family is one of Warren's children. And we know that they are right now working on the courage to be able to come out with their story soon. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times kind of in hindsight, you might see them on our channel and then we can say, oh, they were that source or mm -hmm. this person. But yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely always people who are directly leaving. Yeah. 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 And some people will never get to the point where they want to share their story publicly. And that is okay. That is perfectly okay. Some people, I know people that have left the FLDS church that have not only changed their last name to not be associated with certain people, and typically Jeff's, if their last name is Jeff's. They just, they don't want the attention. They don't want to always be known as the person that was related to Warren yeah. Jeffs because ultimately, unfortunately, because Warren Jeffs is now so public and almost the entire world knows of him because everything that he has done and now he's in prison for, uh, people just don't want to be associated with that. And mm -hmm. so, you know, sometimes there are sources that will never be known. Or, yeah. the, or even just association with the name when they weren't even related. Like we know a girl personally 
that she was groomed to be one of Warren Jeff's wives from the time she was born. Right. And they actually legally gave her the last name Jeff's, even though that's not her family oh, last gross. name because what? she was intended for him. And so she changed her name and, you know, obviously being liberated from that idea that she was meant for him, she needed to be able to take back that power and say, no, I'm not intended for him. I'm my own person. Just so sad. Yeah. And it's so powerful to change last name. I no. did it. So I know <laughs> I didn't want my last name anymore. I was like, no, I want something that is empowering to me and doesn't make me think of my trauma every time I see my last name. So I can 100% yeah. know what that's like. And that's why I kept my last name even when we got married. And my husband was very gracious about that's it. That's right. Good for you guys. Oh, Thank yeah. you. Yeah, it's, namesakes are so interesting. You know, they're they're you could even go the other way with it. We had the uh, the LeBaron sisters on, and they were all about we're going to keep our names and we're going to reinvent what it means to be a LeBaron. Yeah, so they they the it, for wow. them it was empowering to do something new with it. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's awesome to see everybody has their own way of processing, and each way can be beautiful and important. Right. And whatever that person needs is what they deserve to have happen. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So I want to get into these these revelations. But first, I just you made me think of something when you said that the world pretty much knows who he is. I can imagine from what I've seen and the videos that I've seen, he's pretty narcissistic and all about me and power and fame and all of that. Do you know if he knows how infamous he is and how people hate him? Do you think he likes that people know who he is? Mm. That's a tough one. It's... I think that he definitely wanted the attention. I think that from a younger age, he liked attention and he liked to be the person that made the decisions and kind of have power over others in very cruel ways in some cases. But I don't know. I don't. Well, I was going to say, I don't know that his intention was to become popular except for the fact that once he became popular, it seemed like he liked it. Hmm. Because when, even in prison, he would write these revelations. And funny story. So after I left, I left the FLDS church. Not too long after that, I actually joined the main LDS church, mm -hmm. the mainstream LDS church. And then shortly after that, I was on a mission in Chile. And while I was in Chile on a mission... At one of the mainstream LDS church chapels, a letter was received in Chile. And it was a revelation from Warren Jeffs that he wrote while in his prison cell. And so he was sending these revelations worldwide, wow. trying to tell people that they need to change their ways and come to God's truth or they would be destroyed. So there's definitely, he wants to be infamous in a prophetic way. like you know, prophesying to the whole world. We have like booklets upon booklets of revelations to the world, revelations to Congress, revelations oh. giving to the leaders of the United States of America. So he wants to be known. Now, what he's known for, I don't think he appreciates, obviously, yeah. but he definitely wants to be infamous, I think. Wow. Right. Mm. Sounds like Ervo LeBaron sending letters to... The United States president. You know, you know who else it sounds like? Uh, Tiger King. Remember? <laughs> oh, Back yeah. Back in the pandemic, that show really took <laughs> yeah. off and then it became like the biggest sensation. But then he couldn't enjoy his newfound notoriety because he was in prison. Ah, uh, it's interesting. We recently mentioned this, that we were watching uh, some documentary and it, it dawned on us that most people in these high demand, small groups that we cover, for whatever reason... They feel that they have to share their message with the world. Everyone has to know. For mm -hmm. some reason, they all get to that point, and Warren Jeffs is no exception. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this grandiose perspective or this grandiose persona of I'm amazing and you guys should follow me, which makes me think, especially with what he was saying to his other wives, that he doesn't think he did anything wrong. He's like, no, God told me to do this with a 12-year-old. Really? Warren, he's just believing his own BS, his own dogma. And all right, let's get to the crazy stuff. So what has he been saying lately? 
Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Where yeah. to begin? <laughs> so I'd say, yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot of crazy in these revelations. I'll be honest. There is, and I'll go over the ones that we probably won't go very deep into, but he gives very specific details about the afterlife, which really intrigued me being, you know, raised mainstream Mormon. Um, he goes into every single planet orb world exactly who's going to be living on it, um, what color their skin is. He's going to be going through their gender. He like very, very specific things. And most of that comes down to the fact that he's talking about the end of the world once right. again, because this isn't the first time that the FLDS are predicting the end of the world. Oh no! So in July of 2022, he came out with a revelation that it was going to be five and a half years later. Okay. So in about January of 2028, yeah. it's going to be at the end of the world and that the celestial orb where Jesus is living on the sun and Collab. it's going to be coming in the, there's going to be groups lifted up and they're going to be translated and exactly how that's going to happen and where, and it's like I said, a lot of crazy, but most of it comes down to prophesying about the end of the world and that that's going to be happening in the beginning of 2028. Right. It's the detail, you know, raised in or the, the mainstream LDS church afterlife information. A lot of people that weren't raised in it, as you can probably, based on other people you've talked to, you've probably seen that people from the outside looking at the mainstream LDS afterlife, they're like, whoa, this is insane. I've never <laughs> heard of such a thing. But Warren Jeffs takes it to a whole other level. He, I mean, the, the men and women will be separated in the next life if they aren't perfect and if they aren't living with God and they can't live together. So they have their own planets here and there. And, and it's just completely, it's so confusing. We did a video on it, but uh, it's, it's a long story. I wonder if these, because you, you see a lot of the same overlap in the storytelling with like Scientology, for example, with the planets or with um, the Jehovah's Witness, the end of times are near, the rapture. Uh, I wonder if, if within all of these tales, from these prophets, if they, if there's the overlap, if they're all the same, or if they're different, different takes on the same thing, is the mm -hmm. Jehovah's Witness end of times also in 2028, or is that a different end of times? Oh, I think they have their own math. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and in one of in one of these revelations, Warren talks about that the calendars are not correct because Christ's date of birth is different, and so he tries to correct the calendar in one of them, yeah. and that's why it's going to be in 2028 because calendars were off, and so there's like a celestial calendar versus a calendar we have, and a lot of talking about celestial resurrected beings and, you know, it's easy to just go, okay, this is craziness. Um, how, I don't want to say how could anyone like listen, because obviously I understand why the followers follow, but it's mm -hmm. easy to just push it aside if you're an outsider and say, okay, well, that's just a crazy guy being crazy. So why should we care? But there are some things within the revelation that are extremely dangerous, particularly to the women and children that are still in. And right. so that's why it's something that we talk about and that we want to bring up the dangers because there's letting other people just live their religion and then there's protecting families, protecting children from dangerous mm -hmm. situations. And this crosses a line. Right. One of the things that have come up recently in Revelation is the hint at everyone needing to die in order to be translated, which goes against the meaning of translation based on what I'm familiar with anyway. Normally that means that you're, you go from earth to heaven without dying. But he specifies in one of his revelations that everyone will need to be translated. And before they can be translated, everyone needs to die. Oh, geez. So he's hinting at mass suicide. Yep. Their physical body has to stay in the grave on a translated world for a few days and nights. And they being so pure, they can be resurrected same time period as Jesus Christ was resurrected. Yeah. So they believe that the followers are going to have to die and then they'll be able to be translated after they're resurrected like Jesus. Very is, Jonestown. Mm -hmm. That's what we're afraid of. Yeah, this is terrifying. Is there any more context around that? Like what's before and after that whole translated part? So before the translated part, and I'm just kind of reviewing the, the revelations here, but it's talking about the fact that the select... The celestial resurrected center portion of all new Jerusalem, Zion. So Zion's going to be created. There's going to be multiple cities around it. And then there's going to be a lifting up of that new Jerusalem. And that's where everyone is going to need to be. There's going to be a translated planet. And 
in order for that to happen, the people that are in that new Jerusalem will need to be translated, which again, when we were reading through the revelation for the first time, translation typically means, okay, sweet, like city of Enoch, you know, the city of Enoch, here they are and they're just lifted up. Now they're in heaven. And that's the typical understanding of it, like biblic biblically. But then when it adds that caveat in the next verse and says, translated people must die, then we are worried about the mass suicide. Um, a lot of the other parts of these revelations are talking about the gathering everybody. Mm -hmm. So um, women not being able to go to school anymore, women not being able to have jobs anymore, getting rid of cell phones, all these things that can help them become more pure and more ready to be able to get ready for Zion to be translated. Yeah. And so it's a lot of preparation, a lot of fear. And then the caveat at the end is, you have to die first. I'm really hoping that he's referring to some, when he says everyone has to die, I'm really hoping that it's not what it sounds like and that it's this spiritual thing where maybe they go in and there's this ritual and then he's going to claim that, oh, okay, now you have died and now you're this resurrected person. Now, now yeah. we're going to go on and do this next step. That's what I'm hoping, but it sure sounds scary to the point that I was actually talking to someone i'm not going to name names that still believes in and follows warren jeffs and i said because to your point jonathan i said if someone offers you kool-aid say no mm -hmm. because it is too similar to things that we've seen in the mm -hmm. past right. and i was I, I i explained why i said that of course but it's just it's frightening and i have loved ones i have family members that still follow and believe in him full-heartedly and to think that they could just be gone because he says to do something is just terrifying. Yeah. yeah. And even just to add another layer of context here, when my mom was just here and we told her about the text you guys were sending back and forth and what we were going to talk about, she was like, oh, I 100% believe it. She said when she was in the mainstream Mormon church, she literally said, if the prophet told me to go jump off a cliff, I would. That's how devoted I was in just mainstream Mormonism, not even a fundamentalist sect. Right. So I think people need to really be aware that this is a real thing that could happen. It's not so far-fetched. And especially when you're in it, you don't realize things sound extreme. You just are a believer and you're a follower and that's what yeah. it is. So I'm curious to know, and Sam, you know, you were in it at one point. And this is a question that I, I've always kind of wondered is when you are Obviously, when you're born in a cult, you're born in a cult, it's all that you know. Were there things that he was doing that was convincing people that he was the true prophet? Or is, is it everything just talk and people just believe it no matter what without mm -hmm. any kind of... Like miracles or something? Yeah, like is there something that makes people go, we have to follow him for these reasons? Oh, yes. <laughs> this, this gets deep, though. I, I don't know how much time we have to stick on this topic, but yes. Let's just say... I experienced things that to this day I cannot explain. Like what? Wait, now, give us an example. For example, healings. Uh, you know, things you hear about, I experienced those. And this was not in the mainstream LDS church. This was in the FLDS church where I was healed on the spot and stood up and walked away. I, I had to be carried to the location that I received the blessing and stood up and walked away feeling perfectly fine the moment it was done. Whoa. So, now, yeah, how, how would you explain that in now, hindsight now? Okay, so uh, people hate it when I talk about this because they don't, they don't like this topic because it hits too close to home for so many people that believe mm -hmm. in religion, just religion in general. And, and so I try to be as respectful as possible. Sure. I, it's, it's, it's tough to explain unless you look at it as, in my mind, I was so convinced, I knew, I had all the faith in the world. I knew that the moment those words were said, I was going to be fine. I, had, I was a thousand percent convinced of it. Mm. I had no reason not to be. It's the way I was raised. I was still a fairly young boy at this time. And so the moment those words were said, I said, done. I know I'm good. And I stood up and I walked out. And whether it was my mind that convinced me of it, or whether it was some higher power, that's going to have to be left to someone else sure. to decide. But I just know that I experienced it in what everyone, almost everyone in this world will look at as a very harmful and dangerous cult. Wow. Yeah. So you're saying it could potentially be the placebo effect. Or could be something right. else. Or a and, higher power. And, you, it, and many people experience things like this within the 
the cult? I, yes, many people did. Another thing that I will just point out is when you believe in something so strongly, it, it does funny things. Funny things happen. For example, my sister, one of my older sisters, married Warren's father. He was about really? 80 years old at the time. She was an early, an, a young teenager. They, well, she was an, an adult. I think she was 19. Still a teenager. But though. still a teenager. And I believe she was his about 60th wife at the time. Now, this isn't Warren. This is Rulin Jeffs. This is Warren's father. And because of that marriage, we had this connection with the family and we would go and visit them sometimes. And I remember walking into the Jeffs home and Warren Jeffs was there. And I walked in and the power, this, what I would have at that time thought was the spirit, the Holy Ghost, and the peace and the love that I felt in that home was just the most amazing thing. I thought that I had died and gone to heaven was the feeling that I had walking into their home. Keep in mind, this was during the same time that we know what Warren Jeffs was doing behind closed doors in that home. Mm -hmm. But right. those are the feelings I felt because that's what I believed. Yeah. And other things like that, when meeting the Jeffs, I, you know, we would walk up and shake their hands after a meeting and we felt that they could see right through our souls. I mean, they, we, we thought they knew everything. We wouldn't dare lie to them because we knew that they were talking to God and they would know all things. Mm -hmm. And so that there was just no question that they were men of God at that time. Yeah, the power of faith and the power of belief. Right. And Thank the power of just what's around you and what you're being taught, your environment. Thank you for answering that, by the right. way. I know that's a it's a tricky one. It's an existential question. Yes. <laughs> there there's a lot more, but I hope that I hope that to some extent answered your question. No, I for sure. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's one of those things too that almost every bad situation, and I think you see this a lot across the board, and I definitely saw it within the LDS mainstream church as well. Whenever bad things happen, you can almost find a way to twist it into a faith promotion. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's really typical within the FLDS. You know, every if the end of the world didn't happen, it's because they weren't worthy. But then when something good would happen, it was like it doesn't matter if it's good or bad, you can find a way for it to be faith promoting. Yeah. And if it's bad, it's a trial given by God to make us stronger. Right. And if it's good, it's a blessing from God. Mm -hmm. You know, I would see people in my church that would have cancer and then they would testify of how they were grateful that God gave them cancer because they were able to overcome and learn this, this and that. Yeah. Right. And mm -hmm. so when you have that mindset that everything good or bad is still ultimately for the best. And then there is one person who's going to give you access to all of that and help you understand why all of it is the best. Then it's hard for there to be, there's never a losing for God, mm -hmm. right? right? God only wins <laughs> in, in these situations. And so I think it's the same with Warren Jeffs. We had Warren's child, the same um, source, had shared with us that there was a point where Warren told some of his daughters, you are now celestial beings and you no longer need to eat food oh you need to wait until heavenly messengers come and heavenly angels come and they feed you celestial food i'm you no sorry longer need earthly food what so they stopped eating so they stopped eating and our source was saying yeah they stopped eating and they were starving to death and the family f had to interject and say listen this isn't working this isn't true you have to and so Jonathan, I think a little bit to your point, there is certain points, there are certain breaking points where people realize, okay, even this is too much, sure. yeah. you know, and our source was saying the stuff that he's sending out to everyone that we're getting, that the general FLDS population getting, he said, is the tip of the iceberg mm. compared to what the family Warren's immediate family is getting. And as Warren's family is starting to get things that are so crazy that even they can't come to terms with mm -hmm. and can't make work with their faith, they're starting to leave as well. Do you have some of those things? Have they shared them with you that you can share? The revelations that directly to the family? Yeah. Um, the celestial food one was one specifically, and I'm trying to think if- the, the, Another one directly to the family was already mentioned that when he is released from prison, that he will continue on the heavenly sessions. Yeah. That was another one directly to family. There's a lot more that we have not received or mm -hmm. have- haven't seen yet and so we're hoping to learn more and get more information out soon yeah a lot of times when people leave as well it's hard for them to take a whole lot 
And so a lot of times it's just memory recollection or if they can go back and get certain pieces of information, it takes a while. Like we have some friends right now that they're like, I think I have that information that my, you know, my father still has it and he's still in, but I think I might be able to get it, but it might take me a while mm-hmm. and I'd have to, you know, so sometimes getting the information is a little bit harder, but those were right. some of the stories that were shared with us as far as. Okay. Yeah. So what are some of the other things that you printed off? I know you had some sheets of paper that you were going to read from. Um, mostly the one about, I mean, I have all the revelations here. The most important one was the one about the translated people dying. Um, again, I think probably the, I mean, we touched on a lot of it and I try to not read too much directly because I don't like spreading his exact words <laughs> Yeah, he, while still sharing the, the, the gist he of talks, it. The way he talks is even for me being raised out there, it's hard to understand the way he he tries to talk in a way that makes it sound like it's coming from a celestial being and not a human. Mm. Okay. And so he he likes to use words and say things in a way that us mortal people will not really understand. We're like, wait, what is that? Because he speaks in a special way. Yeah, mostly about the translated worlds. And I think I think that's also... I think he talks this way to sound more like a prophet, yeah. right? right? Because when people are raised with the King James Version of the Bible, it's almost this like badge of honor if you can understand it, right? Like, oh, I read the King James Version of the Bible and I'm understanding and comprehending. And then we know that even the Doctrine and Covenants from Joseph Smith, it all has that same sound to it. And so he continues that on, goes to another level. Um, I don't know if we have quite the amount of time to go through some of the talking about the different heavens and how that's all going to work. I will say quickly though, that when he talks about these no glory worlds and these planets, I always wondered being raised LDS, how families wouldn't be together forever. Yeah. Because I feel like the LDS church always emphasizes, you know, families can be together forever. We sing it, we talk about it, we preach it all the time. And I was probably 18 when that was one of like the first questions I ever had within the church was like, well, if you're Mormon and you're together forever, what happens to the people who aren't sealed? Mm -hmm. How do they get separated? Like, how does God decide that these families, like, how are you you in this corner of the room? You in this corner of the room? Like, how does that (laughs) look like? I don't know. It was always a curiosity for me. Yeah. And Warren Jeffs was talking about the fact that each planet is like a planet of women and a planet of men. In oh. the no glory worlds. So in the terrestrial and the telestial and well, we'll go into outer darkness where Sam gets to go later, but <laughs> out of the celestial kingdom in the terrestrial, he talks about the no glory and that there's going to be two. There's going to be one for men, one for women. And then there's going to be, and then he separates races as well into different planets and one for the men and one for the women. And then the telestial, one for the men, one for the women. And then outer darkness is an interesting one he talks about specifically in here because as an apostate, right. you know. If you if you know the truth and then you leave the truth or deny the Holy Ghost, as some would say, yeah. then you, are be, you become a son of perdition mm. and you are no longer allowed to have any glory and you are just in outer darkness suffering for the rest of eternity. And we'll see you there. Bye. Apostates unite. <laughs> yeah, we, we'll both see you there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. According to Warren Jeffs, though, Shalise here and Melissa, we will not be seeing you there. I'll be seeing you there, Jonathan. Okay. <laughs> I'll bring the, the flashlight. You bring the batteries. Perfect. <laughs> you that's, got that, it. That's a joke, Shalise. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I will. <laughs> I'll take credit for that one. <laughs> <laughs> the females, this is how sexist it is. Wait. Yeah. Okay, can we the read girls? this part? I would love to just hear okay. the way he Let's right. Find it. Because Let's find it. Okay. I have to say before I read this, Jalise, this is the part that like makes my blood boil though, is that the women, we get turned into nothingness. Whoa. Right, we're, not, we're not we're worthy not even worthy of outer of darkness. Going to outer darkness. <laughs> we're not worthy of outer darkness. If you are an apostate woman, then and that's what they're told. And I was talking to my, some of my sister-in-laws recently about this, and they said that was so much more terrifying. The fact that we become nothing. Like at least everyone else has something. Yeah. You know, we're told that the terrestrial and the telestial worlds, there's still a happiness there. There's still something. And they're like, but it but was, to have nothing. It was almost a way of saying that the the men need to suffer forever yeah, I was because, say, it's, yeah. because they have responsibility for their actions. But the women, you know, yeah, whatever. You're just going to go into nothing because you don't deserve to suffer forever. 
but you chose a wrong path. So it was almost meant to be like a positive thing for the women. Right. You're not gonna have to suffer for all eternity. But a lot of people that lived in the FLDS and now have moved out had said that this disappearing into nothing seemed a lot scarier to them. Yeah, yes. And I'm trying to skip the racist stuff. Hang on. It's like a backhanded I punishment. Mean, but you don't have to. I'm all for okay. just hearing everything this crazy person it's, has to say. It's well, I just like to clarify racist. because I think it's very racist and sometimes I just hate even saying it because it is so racist. But I will just read it as it is from his revelation so people can get an idea too because I think sometimes people are like, oh, you know, are they really racist? Like, And I'm like, this is from their prophet. Yeah. But thus there are five no glory worlds for the murderers. Now, earlier in the Revelation, he talks about everybody's a murderer, basically. If you live outside of the FLDS, everyone's murderers for a couple of reasons. One, if you use birth control in any form, say. you're a murderer. Mm -hmm. Two, they believe in what they call the killing of unborn babies, which all of us are thinking, maybe they're talking about an abortion thing here. No. If you have any type of sexual intercourse while you're pregnant, that's considered the murdering of unborn babies. Mm. Right. Yeah. In so. fact, just to just to expand on this slightly, I received or me and multiple of my brothers received a letter from my mother, which is she's still in the FLDS. This was a while back. And that was something she said is, please make sure you're not being killing unborn or babies. Killing unborn babies. And I was like, wait, what? We were shocked. Why and would she even consider? What is she thinking we're we doing out be? here? Yeah. And and I knew that I knew based on the fact that I was raised in that too, that they believe most people on the outside are wicked people. But I didn't think that they would assume that. So it was later that we understood, oh, they mean you know, all of these different ways can be considered killing the unborn. Yeah, I had to ask sister in laws because I was like I assume they would mean the same thing for masturbation for men. Yes. Yep. Got it. Yes. Anything that could be used for Spilling the making the of a baby. The baby batter. Yep. <laughs> yep. So just want to clarify. So there are five no glory worlds for the murderers, two for the Caucasian type Gentile peoples, one for men, one for women, two for the Negro peoples, one for men, one for women, totaling four no glory worlds. Then the fifth no glory world is for the most wicked men only sons of perdition who fight against the holy Melchizedek priesthood and against Jesus Christ during their mortal lifetime. <clears throat> amen and amen. That explaineth that these kingdoms are planets and the terrestrial resurrection glory planets, two in number, separate men and women, so they can never have children if they go to the terrestrial resurrection kingdom. And two planets, one for men, one for women, are the telestial resurrection kingdom on two different planets, one for men, one for women, so they can have so they can never have families and children. Thus, only the celestial resurrected individuals who can have spirit children are those who are resurrected to celestial glory. Amen and amen. And then he goes into the different levels of celestial kingdom. But to have so many specifics, I feel like in the LDS, it's now a lot more vague and they continue to make it a little bit more vague. And so I was kind of shocked that he was gutsy enough to try to even say such specific oh, things about everything yeah they've always in the flds they've always been very straightforward they haven't tried to change the doctrine change the belief at all you know the mainstream lds church has done a lot to change the way things are said so mm -hmm. that it doesn't sound racist or it doesn't sound sexist but the flds is they they stick to it the things that brigham young said they are all on board with that everything he taught and they're not Jeez. trying to change anything. And then Warren Jeffs here, we see, adds even more to that belief instead of taking yeah. away. Yeah. And then you only get to be a no glory resurrected person for one year. I'll read this real quick and then we can move on. But it said, those who are resurrected as murderers on a no glory world, five planets of the no glory world herein named, after they are resurrected, they will only exist in their resurrection conditions, not shining with sunlight, in a misery of the buffetings of the devil. They will only be miserable being resurrected. And in mercy, God had authority send them into dissolution. Those on the no glory resurrection worlds, both spirit and no glory resurrected physical body. They will lose their no glory resurrected body even less than one year after they are resurrected, giving the promise that all born on a mortal planet as mortal individuals will be resurrected, yet not remain alive. Because Yeesh. murderers commit the greatest crime, the greatest crime sin, including abortion, murder of unborn children, a common sin crime in this most wicked generation that has ever been on this world. 
So, so you'll get one year. We get one year of resurrection. Hopefully, he's referring to the the heavenly clock, right? Isn't isn't one day a thousand years <laughs> for right. the Lord? Yeah. So I forgot about that. One rule. year is a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is actually kind of going in line with mainstream Mormon stuff, though. Because do you remember hearing about the TK smoothie? Because it was in the in the doctrine that you wouldn't have genitals if you weren't in the celestial kingdom. So he's like, yeah, if you don't have genitals, you can't make a family. Let's just separate the men and the women. Yeah. yeah. No, and that's what, like I said, I almost, I don't want to say I got some answers to my LDS questions through Warren and Jeff. <laughs> but, but I was like, <laughs> at least... But kind of. Some of these, I was like, well, that would make sense. And the LDS doesn't want to talk about it. They just want everybody to be sealed. Everyone's going to end up with an eternal family because why would you not choose to be yeah. Mormon in this life or the next? You know, right. that's kind of the mentality behind it. And so in this, I'm like, that's more of a reality of how can you keep people from being able to be happy and be together? Well, if you separate men and women and they can't have families and they can't be together, I guess that would be the way to do it. You know, the interesting thing here is Warren Jeffs has already done to his followers what he is claiming is going to happen here in that he has right. separated wife and husband and wife. He has separated families. He is not allowing people to get married. He's not allowing people to have children. And so he's already kind of done what he's talking about will happen in the next life to his followers here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I, I've often wondered why. My theory has always been that he isn't allowed to have a relationship in his prison so he doesn't want his followers to have that either. Yeah. But maybe there is maybe in his mind there's a greater reason for that. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. But the separation of families is that it's what's getting along with the scariness of these revelations is that mm -hmm. there's children who are still in it without their mothers. And we were recently talking to a close friend who's she's been out for about a year and she still has children in it and she fought to get her children out. And then as they turned 18, each child so far, I think she has three daughters who are back in it and chose to go back to the FLDS. Mm. Right. And, oh, I'm going to try not to get emotional, but she's like, I hope the next time that I see my daughters, I'm not identifying their bodies. Oh, you know, and it's yeah. heartbreaking to see a mother not know whether or not their children are going to be safe. You would hope, you know, all these mothers, most of the time when they leave, they think their kids are safe. And I just can't imagine being in that situation. It is so heartbreaking and heart-wrenching to see these women fight for their kids. And then because of the way that they taught their children, the children are going back. And even beyond them going back, a lot of them are currently having their children being taken from them mm. and being kidnapped and we kind of also wanted to talk a little bit about that mm -hmm. because there are currently still eight children that are missing that were stolen from their mothers. That we know of. That we know of. Yeah. Um, and that's another thing that we try to raise awareness about as much as possible. And we can share those pictures with you, Shalise, if you'd be willing to yeah. show your followers. So if anybody sees them, they can contact local authorities. But um, I think... I heard Cece might have had to try to get her children back, right? Like mm -hmm. it's a big legal process to be able to get your children back. And basically what was happening is these w women are getting their children back and it's court ordered, but it's still a pain. Nobody is just saying, oh, okay, yeah, here's the court order. So here, let me hand back your children. The FLDS were really fighting hard. There were times that SWAT teams had to be involved in getting the children back, local law enforcement, like forcibly physically removing kids from the caretakers' homes and giving them back to the mothers. And so the FLDS church got smarter and they said, you know what? Instead of having to deal with all this, we are going to have these kids look like runaways when they're not. So the kids are running away when they're in the custody of the fathers, but because they're not at the father's home, the father just says, the kid ran away. They didn't want to go back to their mother's house. Oh. And now the police handle runaways in a completely different way. And then when they cross state lines, it's ridiculously hard to try to find a runaway who's not in the home of any relatives because they have this church community. Mm -hmm. And so they're going in there under the priesthood care of a caretaker. And to the children, they feel like that's what they're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. So they don't think that anything is wrong. Not to mention that when a child, in some cases, when a mother finally gets her child back, in some cases, the church, or in most cases, I guess, the church has taught these children to fear and hate outsiders. If their mother no longer belongs to the church, 
they're going to try to cause as many problems as possible so that they can go back to the church mm. and the, so that she will release them back. And so it's very, it's a very tricky situation. It's not just one of those where if we find the child and we get them back, then all will be well after yeah. that. It's, it's a fight. It's a battle even after the children are returned. But we have heard of, thankfully, a lot of successful cases where the children come around and they realize that their mother isn't this awful, evil person just because she no longer belongs to the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about what's going on or what was going on from South Dakota to North Dakota? I think it's a great follow-up to Brielle's episode where she was held at a house in hiding in South Dakota and kind of what's going on around that. Yeah. So South Dakota was a hub for the FLDS for quite a long time. And there's actually, a, we, we know of a sheriff there that did a lot of work with them and, and worked really hard to gain trust with those of the FLDS to the point that when it came down to it, he was able to build a connection with some of the leaders even, to, and they started to trust him. And he was actually able to help a lot of the girls get out of that situation. Mm. Uh, at that point, though, it wasn't too, how long, do you remember how long they were in South Dakota? I don't know about in South Dakota, but I know it wasn't very long after the sheriff and his wife took in about 11 girls yeah. that basically Helaman moved everyone from South Dakota into North Dakota because right. this sheriff had a good relationship with Helaman. Now, Helaman Jeffs is one of Warren Jeff's sons, and there's a lot of talk within the community mm -hmm. of whether or not Helaman's running the show or if Warren's running the show. Mm. Right. So much so that the revelations that came out in 2022 all had like Helaman's picture and he signed, you know, his testimony at the end. And in some of the revelations, it talks about Helaman being a, a person, you know, that they can trust like, oh, these revelations are coming through Helaman, but they're from Warren. And in 2023, they took Helaman off of it because so many members of the church were saying, oh, Helaman's in charge, not Warren. And Warren is, you know, a narcissist. So he yeah. wanted to make sure that it was from him. But basically Helaman took those people from South Dakota and as he saw people leaving, especially the girls, he created a new compound in North Dakota. Right. So that's currently where a lot of them are, is on in North Dakota, near the border of North Dakota and Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's where they remain at this point. That's where uh, they're talking about, or it sounds like they're talking about building this Zion in, in the Revelations. It talks about these valleys and mountainous areas. And that is kind of what it sounds like is it's there in North Dakota where they will be using these special devices that are celestial devices, as the, he says in the re revelations, and that they will be learning how to use these communication devices and living in homes that are run off celestial light. Celestial light. So, We're like, okay, so solar, solar panels. panels <laughs> but way to make it, way to make yeah. it sound cool. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to run off a celestial light. That's hilarious. So, so that's where they are. They went from South Dakota to North Dakota, and they are scattered out uh, throughout the country as well. There's a lot in Utah still, some in Arizona, Colorado. So there's there's people all over the place, but there's a big compound in North Dakota. Okay. Yeah, people ask a lot, you know, how many members there are still in Short Creek. We get that question yeah. a lot. And Warren, a, a few years ago, he actually sent out a revelation saying there's too many apostates moving in. If you're still faithful to me, you will move out of that area. Mm. And some were left behind. We're heard, we've heard that it's kind of to keep an eye still on what's going on in Short Creek, but there's not very many true believing, full believing members in Warren in Short Creek anymore. They've all kind of dispersed. And there's definitely been communities in Utah. Um, we've been at events talking to local law enforcement, like in Cedar City, mm -hmm. Utah, which is, you know, probably what, 30, 45, 45 minutes, minutes outside of yeah. Short Creek. And they, cool. they're they trying to figure out what to do with the influx of people and how to keep them safe and to make sure that there's not any trafficking situations or kids being stolen from their mothers in their community. So it's definitely been a little tricky as people are going to these new communities and, and people are trying to right. learn how to be kind and accepting and loving towards these people while also keeping their eye out for any secondary crimes. Yeah, so as it stands right now, Hilldale and Colorado City, Short Creek, where the FLDS used to basically all reside, they have it's full of a lot of ex-members of the church now. Mm -hmm. And 
<laughs> something to keep in mind and watch out for, though, is Warren is claiming that eventually they will come back and take back their town. And he's claiming that in some of his revelations that they will be able to come back and reclaim their land. But I don't see that happening. Just another thing that he's claiming and promising his followers. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, because the government took over the trust that all of the land and the homes were under, right? Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the UEP now belongs like through the state of Utah. Right. And then they yes. were dispersing those to F ex FLDS members. So we were talking to Brielle about how she was awarded one of Warren's homes, the 45 bedroom home, which you said you have a tour on your page about it. Yes. We have a tour on our page. Yeah, we've been through there a couple times now. The people there are amazing. Um, and their directors there currently are wonderful. So it's now the Short Creek Dream Center. And so um, Brielle graciously donated it to the Dream Center. And yeah, 45 rooms. Yeah. And there's the people there are allowed to stay as long as they need, which is amazing because a lot of other places, it's just hard. If people don't understand the situation of the FLDS or where the FLDS people are coming from, they're not going to be able to help them adequately. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and so it's really great to see they have a whole women's and children's floor, a whole men's floor, lots of big family rooms. And yeah. And though it's, it's owned by the the Dream Center, they a lot of the people working there, including Brielle, are people that are from the FLDS. Yeah. So there is this place for people to go where they will be understood very well. And it was actually Brielle that gave us the tour of the Dream mm. Center. So yeah. it was kind of cool to see it from her side, from someone that actually lived there during the time that Warren Jeffs was uh, in charge. Yeah. Or I guess he still is in charge, but when he was there. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. I'm so glad that they have that resource. What an incredible way. I was telling Brielle, I was like, what a big F you to Warren <laughs> to take his house and turn it into a sanctuary for members who don't want to follow him anymore. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah, it's interesting yeah. because a lot of people will say like, oh, is that triggering or like, is that hard? And um, I don't know yeah. if you talked to Brielle about this, but, you know, it's I it's kind of bittersweet. And from the other people that we've talked to there that we've um, formed really close friendships with some of the people that are there and, you know, they say, yeah, it is. There's the, the FU side of it of, you know, we're taking this back and then there's still like this somberness of what had happened and them still even being in the community at all. And then the directors have shared that sometimes people come in and there'll be something new that's triggering that they didn't realize was a trigger, yeah. you know? So they yeah. just took down the pray and obey off the chimney a few yeah. weeks ago. And that was a mm -hmm. huge thing that they said, yeah, some people would see that. And it was just super triggering to still see on the fireplace, pray and obey. Right. And so they took that off. Um, I know they shared with us that there was a hook in one of Warren Jeff's inspection rooms. And there was a young girl who came in and, and she was like, the hook is still there. And so they quickly tore that off the wall. So right. they're constantly trying to make it a place where it's not too triggering and so that it can yeah. be more of like an empowerment um, type area for these people. Yeah. And over time, they are slowly but surely remodeling different rooms and areas to make it uh, a better place, I guess, and less triggering for some people. Yeah. I think they've done most of it except for Warren's room, yeah. which is super creepy. Warren's room super creepy. It's the exact same metaphor as the, the the dichotomy of the keeping the namesake. You keep it, it's a little triggering, or you reinvent it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. So was there anything else that we'd miss that you think is really important to share about the current events around Warren? I would just say one thing that we try to share as much as possible is a lot of people ask, what can they do? Mm -hmm. You know, especially if someone who's FLDS moves into your community and people go, I don't know what to do. They don't really want to talk to me. They don't really want to associate with me. Um, how, I don't know, just a little bit of like hopelessness of how do you help people that are in this situation? And through everybody that we've talked to, the biggest help that people can be is to just be super kind to them mm -hmm. and understand that they probably aren't going to be kind back at first. And you have to accept that that's how it's going to be and be okay with that. But to just continue to be kind because there's going to be a point for most of these people, hopefully most people, that they're going to realize, okay, all these people aren't evil. They mm -hmm. can be kind. They can be generous. They can be good people outside of the world that we're living in. And that's all, almost always where the seed of somebody leaving starts with somebody on the outside that was kind to them. Yeah. Yeah. For me, you know, based on my personal experience, when I left, 
really what gave me the courage to move out. Ultimately, there were things that I didn't really agree with, you know, as far as the rules and different things. But what gave me the courage to move out when I did was the kindness of people outside of the FLDS. And I think Mm -hmm. that is a very common story that everyone feels and hears because we are taught, or at least most people are taught within the FLDS that the outside world is dangerous, full of people that are being controlled by Satan, trying to take down his church and his work, or sorry, trying to take down God's work and his church. And so they're afraid of the outside world. And when you meet someone from the outside world that shows you kindness and that is a happy person and seems to be on in a really good place in life, it makes you start to question and wonder, you know, oh, is this true or is the outside world not as bad as they make it seem? Mm -hmm. We had on my cousin and her husband, Ben Barlow from the FLDS, and his moment was someone giving him chapstick that he said that was the moment where he realized because he was working construction and his lips were just so chapped and this girl walked over and just handed it to him. And he said that was the defining moment where he realized, oh, she actually did something nice. She cares about me. (laughs) Something so simple. Yeah. Interesting. And that's, I feel like there's a lot of stories like that. Like we know a family where the kids were taken away and the parents were sent away and their kids were basically starving and the neighbor was offering them hot, hot chocolate on a day that they were out shoveling snow and they're like, and that neighbor will never know that that was mm. like the only oh. bit of sustenance they were going to get for that day was hot chocolate and some candy, you know? And so oh things like gosh, that that don't seem like a big up. deal. I know. <laughs> I'm like, ah, but Yeah, things like that. It can be the simplest, tiniest things. It might not even feel like a big deal to you, but it can make a world of difference. Right. I think one of the worst things to do would be going up to them and asking if if they're from the FLDS. Are you from the FLDS? A question like that might just kind of scare them away. And, oh, oh, these guys are trying to interrogate me. You know, that might be the mindset because they are, a lot of them are really afraid of the outside world. And so just treating them like, another neighbor, another human, Mm -hmm. something that, you know, just try to be as normal as possible. And I think that's the best you can do. Yeah. And I imagine it would be amplified even more. All of those interrogating questions that I used to get as a regular Mormon that drove Mm -hmm. me crazy. So this is a a call to action for everybody or a call to not act of (laughs) when you meet someone and you find out that's their history. Don't immediately go for the religious jugular questions of how many moms, how many siblings? What was it like to escape? Because it can be really triggering for people. And like you were saying earlier, They just want to move on sometimes. They just want to find a new life. They don't want to dig into their past because it can be really difficult to relive or to think about. It may not be for everybody, but just knowing that don't be the person that inserts yourself into their trauma. If they open up and want to talk about it, yes, please be there for them. But don't be the one that just goes right for it and makes them talk about it. Yeah, because it kind of makes it where their trauma is your entertainment. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And everyone's journey is a little bit different. To be honest, Mm -hmm. I didn't mind questions when I moved out. I thought it was honestly... Because you have the trauma behind it. You're yes. You're lucky. Yeah, and, and that's my point is everybody's experience is, experience is different. I had a pretty, I mean, I thought a great childhood, honestly. And so when I moved out, I didn't think that anyone would even be curious. I, I thought I had the most boring life in the world. I was like, <laughs> why would anyone want to know about my life? And so when people were very curious and started asking these questions, for me, I thought, oh, do I have something interesting to share? You know, maybe oh. I'll maybe I'll share it. And so it was different for me, but everyone has completely different experiences. Even my own siblings living in the same home yeah. had such a different experience than I did. So that is definitely left up to the individual. Yeah, just be conscious of it. So with that, we need our Linda Listen moment from both of you. Sassy <laughs> statement or inspiration. Whichever you decide. You go first this time. Okay. I am not prepared for this. (laughs) (laughs) You can't say you didn't know it was coming. I did know it was coming. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. And then I quickly forgot. No, uh, really, I would say, Linda, listen, everyone is constantly learning and growing. I always say that the more I learn, the less I know. And I stand behind that to this day. Just when I thought I had the truth, just when I thought I had it all figured out, I learned something that changed my mind. 
And to this mm -hmm. day, I continue on a daily basis to learn something new and it helps me grow. It helps me change my mind about a certain thing, be more understanding about someone else's belief. And so I would just say it's a good thing to continue, continually be open to learn and grow. And don't try to feel that you know it all and that when someone else has a question or maybe a someone has a a bad thing to say about your belief i don't know that everyone has all of the answers so just try to be understanding where other people might be coming from and be being willing mm -hmm. to listen and grow with them i love that so much 100 percent agree Amen. okay go go for yours <laughs> melissa okay listen linda listen to your gut and when you know things are off, be willing to go the other way and reach out to those people who are willing to support you following what you know is right in your heart, regardless of what a singular person has to tell you. Yes, that individual sovereignty. We're all for yes. that over here. <laughs> so good. Thank you guys so much for coming on and sharing. This is so helpful. And if you have anything like this in the future that you think needs to be broadcast, please let us know because we are happy to further broadcast th these messages. It's so important that people are aware of what's going on. And do you have any final thoughts before we plug all of your channels? <laughs> no, we just appreciate you having us on and letting us share these things, especially when it comes down to the endangerment of children or the, the people who are just doing the best they can. That's where we really want to make sure that people are aware and I guess the final thought would just be, um, again, we'll share like pictures of these children that are yes. missing. If there's something you see in your community that's happening within the FLDS or neighbors or something, please also reach out to law enforcement. If you see something sketchy happening, that's the best way for us to hopefully be able to find these children and to get people out of these dangerous situations. Yes. Yeah. I would just back that up and say just try to be aware of your surroundings and uh, if there's ever a moment where you can share share or land a helping hand in any way or just kindness that's the best way to help all of these people yeah great advice and we're also going to put the link to holding out help in the description if someone wants to support in a more financial capacity or donate anything you can find more information on their website and you guys have an incredible channel growing up in polygamy we'll put those links in the description and do you have any social media that you want to add as well Instagram's growing up in polygamy as well. So yes, and we are on all the podcasts. And this is a true collaboration. C2C is going to be on Sam and Melissa's channel, Growing Up in Polygamy. So yeah. after you're done watching this video, go watch that video. It's going to be linked in the description. Thank you. Yes, Perfect. we're so excited for that as well. <laughs> Looking forward to it. To finally hear more of your story. Yeah, I mean, I feel the same way as you sometimes. I'm like, isn't that interesting? But sure, I will. I would love to come on your channel. I'm honored. So guys, thank you so much for watching. Leave those comments, words of encouragement down below. If you want to support the podcast even further, liking and sharing again is extremely helpful. Um, you can get some of our merch at colstaconsciousness.com under the merch tab. We have some Apostates Unite t-shirts and some other fun things over there. We just added some baby onesies in honor of our little one coming. I don't want to be in your cult and cult free kid, which I think is fun. And if you want to come to Costa Rica, you can do that too. You guys should both come to Costa Rica with us. Yeah. Um, it's going to be fun. It's at the end of August this year. We can officially say now that we're in January. And there is about seven spots left at the time of this recording. Um, and I think that's about it. Oh, Patreon. You could do that at patreon.com slash cults to consciousness if you'd like to support monthly. And we will leave two videos down here below that you want to check out. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious and be well.